Welcome back to the Road to City Hall. We're turning our attention back to the controversy that has plagued the city's public housing authority over the last week. My first guest tonight has faced an intense backlash, including some calls for her resignation ever since it was revealed that NYCHA had failed to conduct lead paint inspections and then knowingly submitted paperwork to the federal government saying that the agency was in compliance. Joining me now to share her side of this story is the chair and CEO of the New York City Housing Authority, Shola Alatwaye. Uh, thank you for being here. I know it is a difficult time. Thank you, Aaron. Um, as, as near as I can tell, you correct me if any of this is wrong, um, even from the DOI report and everything that I've looked at suggests that there were two different standards that NYCHA was supposed to comply with about reporting on whether or not apartments have been inspected for possible lead paint contamination. Uh, there's local law one, which is our law, which is more stringent than the HUD requirement, um, which was loosened a little bit in 2012. Did we fail to comply with both or either, or was there some confusion about that within the agency? Well, thank you for, for inviting me on the show to talk more. So first, you're absolutely right. There are two standards. Uh, there is the HUD federal statute, uh, which is really specific to the unit. Then here in New York, there's local law one, which is really specific to units with children under the age of six. Mm -hmm. In August of 2012, then administration, NYCHA administration, uh, chose to suspend annual inspections at the direction of HUD and the reality is they got it wrong the interpretation of that guidance was was not uh, was not done well and that led to this current issue of HUD, compliance HUD told, gaps. HUD told them that they only needed to do it every other year is that right? The, the actual direction was that there could be a relaxing of the annual inspection obligation. Mm -hmm. Housing authorities were still required to have some methodology to account for how often are you getting into apartments. So now your administration, that's 2012, Correct. your administration comes in in 2014. Uh, at what point did you realize that compliance with HUD and or local law one was was not happening. Well, in one of the, it was really important that when we came in, if you recall, there had been a significant backlog in work orders, and uh, finally the administration had ta had gotten those numbers to a manageable amount, and so inspections restarted again in uh, 2014, and it was an affirmative act. It was actually said. We're going to get into your apartments and find out and do the work that we know is there. And so I did not understand at that time that even the restarting of those inspections to get into apartments every two years mm -hmm. still fell short of the federal and the local obligation. You were already a year or two behind. That is correct. So you were going to be out of compliance there. Okay, so uh, it comes to your attention. Um, when exactly were you personally clear that okay we're out of compliance right. we've got to do something right in April of 2016 it became clear to me that we had a local law one compliance gap mm -hmm. I raised my hand I came forward with a plan with our to our colleagues at City Hall and said we got to get into these units with children under the age of six and that was our focus at that time mm -hmm. so now you told City Hall that why didn't you tell the tenants that at that well, time? Well, actually, Errol, we, we specifically communicated with the 4,200 or so units or, or households um, that had units under the age of six. And we did that in a very sort of standard procedure, which is we put a notice under the door that we needed to get immediate access to those apartments to eliminate the, the risk, the potential of a lead-based paint hazard. Mm -hmm. And what were, the, what were the results of that? When you got to all of those, and uh, these are the most vulnerable, We'll leave the broader compliance issue aside. What, what did you find? Were there apartments that had kids under six with elevated lead levels? So thankfully we got into all of those, those 4,200 units. Um, we generated approximately 2,500 work orders and we did that by the end of the year and completed the work by the first quarter of this year. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we know New York City enjoys record level lead poisoning levels amongst children. So we have been able to solidify for 2016, and because this is an annual obligation, we're in the process of doing it again for 2017. Okay, so um, the compliance numbers or figures or reports that went to HUD that said, yes, we're in compliance, somebody's, it's checked off and your signature is somewhere on there, those reports or that um, attestation to compliance that had not happened how did that happen? Why did that happen? And, 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 and for me, more importantly, 
what, were, what, were, what incentive would there be to say we've complied if you knew that you hadn't? Right. So in hindsight, I shouldn't have signed the form. It was a mistake. I had just sat down with our regulators and disclosed in depth the, the, the gaps that we had uncovered, both on the local law side and the HUD side. And so I think what is really important is I have to ensure that every piece of paper that's presented to me is accurate and correct. And that's mm -hmm. why I announced the creation of a compliance department last week and the mayor announced the appointment of an acting compliance officer who will advise me on ensuring that we set up a, pra a pragmatic, uh, workable system to ensure that this doesn't happen again. There, there have been reports that the U.S. Attorney's Office is investigating this. Um, w what are they investigating? Do they think that there was some kind of deliberate effort to mislead the federal government? So look, we have been working collaboratively with the U.S. Attorney's Office for two years. And that's been something that I have led. Prior and, to and the, the compliance issues you were talking about from 2016? They, it, is, it started in fall of 2015, so two years as of October. Mm -hmm. And we have been working collaboratively, providing information, et cetera. And, you know, we all want the best for our residents. We want to ensure the health and safety of our residents remains at the forefront. And so these issues have come to light as part of that investigation. And what we are now focused on is how do we ensure that work gets done, information is shared, and that we can ensure that NYCHA is in compliance well, going what, forward. What brought them in in the first place in 2015? You know, I, I can't speculate to that. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we were on the receiving end of essentially a, 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 a subpoena for information. And so thus began a very intensive process of information and document sharing and interviews, et cetera. And that's what we've been engaged in. But you, the last you can years. intuit from the nature of the, the documents or the information they're requesting kind of where they're going, right? Yeah. And it wasn't all about lead. No, it's very broad to conditions at NYCHA. Look, I think the point here is we were brought in, this administration has been focused on day one, which is NYCHA's had 40 years of disinvestment. We have from day one said that we had to engage in a pretty, uh, an extensive turnaround effort, and that's what we've been a part of. The U.S. Attorney's work is no different. They want the best for our residents as well, and that's what we're focused on. Okay, so now for, for the families who were there, and this is the real bottom line for them, uh, are they safe? Are all of the uh, apartments going to be uh, inspected on time in compliance with local and federal uh, requirements? So, yes, you know, New York enjoys record low levels of child le lead poisoning, and one child is still too many. But from 2010 to 2017, there have been 17 ch children mm -hmm. at, with 18 NYCHA addresses where this has been a, an issue. We have gone in, we've remediated those issues, and now as part of our annual inspections are ensuring that we can certify um, accurately that those units have been inspected and the work has been done. Okay. Um, there have been calls for your resignation. Are you planning to resign? I am not planning to resign. I serve at the pleasure of the mayor, and as long as he has confidence in the work and the plan that I'm working towards, I will continue to work on behalf of the 1 in 14 New Yorkers who call there, home. There have been these questions about whether or not the uh, federal government is going to recommend some kind of over some kind of monitor or even, I don't know if receivership is on the table, something along those lines. There was a further conversation about that on the state level today. What is the situation and do you expect to be able to operate independently? Well, look, NYCHA is not new to the concept of oversight. Um, you know, we actually have, as you know, a federal monitor as it relates to, to mold. So, look, we are embracing of change and we um, will continue to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office on, on the issue of a monitor or ongoing uh, oversight, um, again, to ensure the health and safety of our residents. When I, I was surprised to see um, how aggressive uh, some of the state statements from state officials were. Uh, one thing the governor's office seemed to suggest was that without needing legislation or any other further process, they could, if they w wanted to, sort of assume responsibility for NYCHA. Is that your understanding as well? Look, you know, I'm not a politician. I know that today we have a $17 billion capital need. That's what we need in order to get our apartments up to a good state of working repair. And as you know, because I've said on this program, I'm willing to talk to anyone about how we can get those resources to do the work to ensure that people have good quality homes. Uh -huh. So if the state wants to take it over, it sounds like you're saying um, 
if you've got 17 billion, let's talk. You know, this is going to be an ongoing conversation that the U.S. Attorney's Office is ultimately going to have the final say in. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, when I when I see politicians um, sort of, um, I don't want to use the word grandstanding. I, they're they're expressing concern, but if that concern comes without um, money attached to it, it does start to sound a little bit, to me at least, like grandstanding, right? I mean, look, you know, I, I, there is. This is a turnaround effort. And, you know, one of the hallmarks of this administration is that we have talked to everyone, people who disagree with us, who agree with us. And so we don't lack for opinions. What we lack is funding. And we, we need that in order to not only ensure that people have safe, decent homes, but that we can in assure, ensure, and certify that mm -hmm. they have safe, decent homes. So, you know, Let's talk about the resources that are needed as a city. What kind of city do we want to live in when one in 14 New Yorkers cannot live in safe and decent ho housing? And that's the work that I'm focused on as part of Next Generation NYCHA. Okay. We will uh, leave you to it. We'll wish you a happy holiday. Thank, Thank you for you. coming by tonight. I know it's been a, a difficult uh, few days for you. We are going to take a short break here. Straight ahead, we'll get reaction to this interview from four top political strategists in our Monday Consultant's Corner. Later on tonight, billionaire philanthropist Tom Steyer is going to join me to explain why he's spending his own money, a lot of it in fact, on a campaign to try and impeach President Trump. Stay with us.